Hello, live from Washington, D.C. and all around the world. Welcome to another installment of the Atlantic Council Geotech Center, where today we're going to be discussing data and AI in space. Yes, in space, in particular, what advances have occurred over the last five to six years, and what are we looking in terms of the future that will allow us to do things in space that in the past were not possible because we had to send things to ground stations. I have a very illustrious group of people, some in California, some in Sweden, some here on the East Coast, and we're going to be talking to you today about what we're seeing about what's happening. We're going to be using the hashtag Good Tech Choices, which is part of the Geotech Center, and I need to remind people, by geotech we mean the geopolitics of new technologies and data. We're not doing geospatial, yes, that's important, but we are focusing more on geopolitics. And with that, I'd like to first go to Sweden and ask for Frederick Brun. Frederick, could you sort of talk to us, what are some of the exciting trends you're seeing at Unibop when it comes to data and AI from space-based assets? First of all, thank you, David, for having me on this uh, panel. Uh, yes, AI in space is doing tremendous progress, uh, not the least in the US where you have um, the DARPA program, Blackjack, for instance, uh, what we're seeing now is a commoditization of uh, data in space, very similar to what you have here on ground. You're starting to, starting to see mesh networks, you're starting to see orchestration of various containers so that you can deploy apps very rapidly and efficiently. You're starting to see communication networks coming in place that allows you to have real-time access to your space assets. So really, it's a very big change in the industry, going from a particular space model with bent pipe models where you basically send data back and forth to actually involving the space segment as a node on internet. So it's becoming a space internet, more or less. Excellent. And, and I know Vince Cerf will be glad to see the space internet being rolled out, given the work that Vince done with Internet Protocol as well. Uh, so next, we're going to go to Amy Webb. And Amy, what are you seeing in terms of trends and future trends that are shaping both what's possible with space, but also with data and AI together? Sure. And just again, uh, thank you so much for convening us. We had a, a fun chat before we started this session with lots and lots of very dry physics jokes. Uh, so <laughs> I'm a quantitative futurist and our job uh, in part requires us to track longitudinal trends using you know, data. So I wanna offer uh, three areas that we see some important movement and, and new signals in uh, with the caveat that these aren't intended to be trendy trends. These are, <laughs> uh, you know, th these are models that we've been building and tracking for a long time. So those areas have to do with hardware, software, and networking. So on the hardware side, obviously, I think everybody's aware that there's a tremendous number of microsat, cubestat uh, constellations that are uh, supposed to be launching this year. And I think even with the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, some of those launches could be delayed, but overwhelmingly, they'll, they'll still go up. This is important because as more of these constellations come online, it's going to give us the ability to map near uh, to, to create near real time maps. Uh, and I know those who work directly in the field like to say we're kind of far away from that. But um, all of the peripheries uh, on the periphery, all of the different um, tools and technologies are making that uh, it's, it's going to make that uh, sort of faster um, that, than it would have otherwise. And, and what we're talking about here is not just monitoring traffic and uh, polar ice cap melt, but also, um, you know, crop damage, uh, what, what people are doing, and potentially this becomes an accelerant uh, to, to getting us closer to some kind of post-normal COVID world. Um, so we're talking about near real-time images that can be captured with space, coupled with uh, machine learning and analysis. So that's on the hardware side. On the software side, we're looking at AI as a service, not just in space, but in general. But here, um, this is particularly important because Google, NVIDIA, lots of other companies are building um, the types of systems uh, that are locally, um, local driven processing uh, and, and making it easier to make decisions on device um, versus just in the cloud. So, so one interesting component here is in the space of edge computing, um, which will just lend itself to faster processing and many more applications. 
Finally, and this is a little bit further out, uh, is on the networking side of things, and that's space-based quantum internet, which I know sounds totally sci-fi and made up, but uh, what we're talking about is a space-based um, quantum computer that can use special equipment and algorithms to perform wildly complicated uh, computations faster and more efficiently than a classical computer might. And we're still some years away from quantum computing, but some physicists uh, would argue that you know, quantum networks are possible and moving some of this into space affords us um, more opportunity to experiment and learn. There are obviously geopolitical implications uh, stemming from you know, the fact that we haven't really had a cohesive national strategy, uh, a clear long-term strategy on off-planet exploration and satellite use, which oftentimes leads to clashes between the public and private sectors. Um, however, I think that there's a tremendous amount of opportunity, in fact, an opportunity to, to get some of our collective agencies and companies working together in new ways. Excellent. And thank you, Amy. And definitely look forward to sort of diving deeper, as like you said, about how do we get industry and governments uh, to work on this. I would like to now turn to California. And, and Paul, if you could introduce yourself mm -hmm. and talk a little bit about what are some of the new advances you're working on, um, at, at where you're at, and, and what you're doing in your role. That would be great. Yeah, I'm. Uh, thanks again, David. Uh, I'm Paul Jurison. I'm the director of the Cal Poly Digital Transformation Hub, uh, and we're in San Luis Obispo, California. Um, the Digital Transformation Hub is a, uh, a relationship between Amazon Web Services and Cal Poly. And what we do is we bring innovation guidance to the public sector. So we work specifically with governments, nonprofits, um, and uh, and organizations that are looking to solve big global problems um, in a way that maybe people hadn't thought of before. So uh, some of what we're doing uh, in the last year or so is we're putting together some programs to be able to get more satellites into space and more assets into space more quickly. So um, we announced a satellite data solutions initiative last year where we're working with um, Amazon Web Services and their ground station team to be able to um, really remove barriers for getting commercial companies, smaller commercial companies into space and accelerating the innovation that some of these companies can, can provide, right? So if we have more platforms in space that can be launched more quickly, we have the ability to have um, more innovation being done to solve the big world problems that are out there. How can we predict um, emergencies? How can we respond to emergencies much more quickly, almost in real time? Um, but we don't have the number of, of satellites up there today that can provide that real time information and we can't process the data fast enough in space, but that's coming, right? One of the things that we do at the Digital Transformation Hub is to get organizations to think about what might happen in the future. Let's remove the barriers. Let's think about um, what innovation can happen in the future. The art of the possible is what we like to call it. Um, and the art of the possible is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, one of the things that we do at the Digital Transformation Hub is to include our students, um, whether they're engineering students, business, liberal arts, all kinds of students involved in many of these challenges that we work on. And the reason we do that is that the students don't have those barriers um, that are built into many of the rest of us, right? We've been working in the industry. I've been working in the industry for more than 30 years. Um, and I have a bunch of barriers built in because I don't think, I can't think outside of the box as well as a student who's say 20 years old, right? So we'll bring them a problem and they'll come up with great solutions because they don't have those barriers in place. So we try to do that as well at the, at the Digital Transformation Hub. Um, so what we're, again, what we're trying to do there is to remove the barriers to getting CubeSats, SmallSats in space by being able to launch more quickly, standardizing the equipment, um, and getting those assets in space more quickly. Excellent, Paul. And, and I like how you, you say that it's a sort of this, you, you know, you're not just serving as, as a instructor, teacher, and educator, but you're also learning from those that don't necessarily have the same restrictions as to what can be done and it's a sort of a co-development of creativity there. Uh, yeah. With that, actually, I'd like to turn to one of the most creative people that I know, uh, Anthony. Anthony, could you talk a little bit about who you are, what you do, and sort of the challenges that you're using uh, to, to use satellites for when it comes to data as well? Thank you very much for the kind words, David, and for the invitation today. I'm the chief data scientist at Dun & Bradstreet. So we are sort of commercial users of information. We 
have a very large commercial database. It's collected from information all over the world about companies and their interaction with one another. As you might imagine right now, huge challenge. Who's still in business? Who's connected to whom? What's happening to the globally disrupted supply chains of the world? How will we know what new normal is and will there ever be any kind of new normal? And that doesn't even begin to address new types of fraud and malfeasance and so forth. So we've used data uh, that comes from space. Uh, we've used satellite imagery in the past. Uh, when the Fukushima incident happened in Japan, as an example, we looked at previously unbroken straight and curved lines that had been broken in order to understand what happened to infrastructure. We had ground, brown versus green scores. We looked at the regression line of the horizon. We counted cars and parking lots. We measured something I call rhombohedral distortion, which is sort of how your, your latitude and longitude calculations get stretched because the earth isn't a sphere. So there's lots of really cool things that we can do. The problem is, as was mentioned by the previous speakers, the data has latency built into it. Not all of the data is entirely complete. And now people know that people are looking at them from space and so they change what can be seen. So definitely lots of change going on in this space with this sort of data, no pun intended. And, um, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see how AI folds on top of this. Some of the things that we can do, for example, with Bayesian methods to understand how things are changing as they're changing could be very promising. Amy mentioned quantum computing being way in the future. I'm voting for not so way in the future because that would sure help right now. A very exciting time to be looking at this sort of data and technology. Excellent. And thank you, Anthony. And, and, and building on what Anthony just talked about, Amy, if I could turn to you now, I'd actually be interested in your thoughts. Are there, are, there, are there challenges that we might be able to resolve with new ways of working together between industry and government? I mean, clearly we've got autocratic nations that don't separate their private and their public sector, but what could more open societies possibly do? Or are you seeing interesting experiments that can actually do public-private partnerships better when it comes to data and AI in space? Sure. So just a quick note, um, my way in the future uh, is like 30 years into the future. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so for me, uh, five years out, 10 years out is, is much more nearer term. Uh, look, I run a research institute called the Future Today Institute. We are management consultants and we deal with these questions in the public, public and private sectors all of the time. Um, the challenge is that the technology itself lends itself to extraordinary opportunities. Um, so while on the one hand, we could see the number of cars moving in and, moving in and out of a Walmart uh, sh you know, shopping uh, parking lot or watching shipping containers as they move or perhaps even looking for uh, changes to baselines of forests so that, you know, something that we might miss, but, you know, with the human eye, uh, computer vision and machine learning could help us detect uh, challenges within forests. So there's a, there's a lot of opportunity there, but not without really thinking through privacy implications, because it's not just how you individually feel, it's how our governments are going to react. And the, the bottom line is that we have sort of a, a three-tiered approach to privacy, artificial intelligence, and data in the world right now. We've got China, which she's, you know, sort of a has a more autocratic uh, panopticon uh, approach to this that ties into some of their other geoeconomic and geotechnical policies, including the, the Belt and Road Initiative. We have the United States, which as a free market economy has taken a sort of different approach, a much more open approach, which is build first, try to regulate after the fact. Usually that doesn't work out. And then we have the European model, um, which is sort of in the middle. The challenge is once we're off planet, you know, it's one thing to regulate data usage, uh, artificial intelligence, and some of the other parts of the ecosystem within geographic borders, which was already difficult given the fact that many of our technologies uh, and our digital systems don't respect geographic borders. Once we go off planet, you know, a satellite doesn't, or a constellation doesn't stay in a fixed spot overhead, you know, so, so these are real problems that we, we, um, we have to deal with, but I see actually those problems as opportunities. Um, as, a, as a futurist, when I'm working on farther future you know, scenarios, some of which are dystopian, uh, if we get you know, down a certain path um, and we've got all the data and all the modeling and everything else and you can't work your way around it, we usually hope for an alien invasion. 
right? And that's sort of, that's like the big thing that helped. That's like the end of the Watchmen, all the right. big best. Right? Independence Day, exactly. That's yes. right. But like, <laughs> we are currently living in a dystopian future and we've gotten our alien invasion because, you know, viruses are basically just malware, right? Right. Um, I kind of expected this was going to be the catalyzing factor that brings us together and it hasn't been. So there's a way for us to think about the future of artificial intelligence and, and satellites and off-planet exploration from a planetary perspective. And I think if we are willing to do that, that uh, sort of has a longer lasting output than whoever happens to be in office, whichever country we're talking about, you know, it could be a new kind of moonshot um, that, that, that affords not just better, you know, intergovernmental uh, collaboration and cooperation, but also leads to, you know, new business opportunities, better growth, all the rest of it. Excellent. And so uh, uh, building on what Amy just said, Anthony, she talked about how we need to recognize that, that you know, we, we, they transcend borders, we've got data questions, and, and could this be a better way to rebuild the world post-COVID? So from your perspective, what's your thoughts? So I, I was sitting here doing a hear here to a lot of what Amy just said. There's, uh, I work with regulators around the world who are grappling with these issues. Countries don't necessarily want one thing. Think about what, what does this country want? And not even this country, we represent multiple countries on this call, right? Uh, when you say China wants blah, well, you, you don't talk to China. There's a lot of people in China and there are different factions. So national security and uh, uh, helping the economy and helping small business. Those are two things to want at the same time, which leads you in opposite directions in terms of provenance and permissible use and what data you can use and what data you may use and what data you should use. Um, same thing all over the world. Regulators are thinking about these issues and then layer on top of that ethical use of AI and whatever that means in different parts of the world. And layer on top of that, you didn't realize that if I watch your lights go on and off from space in your on your block, I can figure out a lot about your your habits and your movement. So I think this issue of can we, should we, may we, uh, is going to continue to evolve and become much more complex as the data sphere continues to expand. I think the amount of information that is produced, regardless of where it comes from, is going to be part of the challenge, but then you have things like adversarial manipulation. You have um, what borders are you in when you're on the internet? Uh, don't get me started with in space, right? Um, right. There were some very interne very interesting um, international provenance issues when Sputnik overflew other countries, right? Laws that hadn't been written and things that hadn't been tested were there now. And to your point about the the alien invasion being already here. Uh, you know, I hope we don't beat each other to death with our respirators, right? We, we're not necessarily collaborating very well right now. And so we got to do a better job of that. Very good points. And you're right. These are these are thorny issues that in the midst of everything else that we're experiencing, you would hope this would be a way to rally across sectors and nations. Um, that's why we're here at the Atlanta Council. Um, that's why I know all of you are on this call. Really salient points, though, because that does not seem to be the overall trend we're seeing. And so thank you for that, Anthony. And Paul. Since, since you have an interesting relationship as a both an educational institution and then also working with a private sector partner, maybe you could explain sort of like some of what you're doing in that partnership. And then maybe what, what, what are the students bringing in terms of new ways of working together that maybe we haven't even thought of yet? Yeah, sure. Um, so the Digital Transformation Hub works uh, with AWS in a variety of ways. So our team at the Digital Transformation Hub is made up with, of uh, Cal Poly employees and AWS employees. So we have uh, digital innovation experts, we have solutions architects who understand um, many of the AI and other products that are out there, machine learning products. Uh, we have project managers. Uh, and what we do is we really focus on understanding the customer that we're working with. So whether it be you know an Air Force base or a launch facility perhaps, or maybe a city or county, or even a nonprofit, right? Or an international development organization. What we really try to understand is what the problem is that they're really trying to solve. And in our innovation process, that's really what we do, right? We bring in uh, subject matter experts from both the public and from the organizations we're working with. And what we find is that 
in many cases, the people that we bring into our innovation workshops have never worked together before. So they're getting insights from lots of different parts of, of the organization and parts of the, around the problem. Um, and we really try to get the people who are going to benefit from a solution to a problem in that workshop. So, you know, if, if we're working with, for example, um, a space launch company who wants to be able to launch rockets faster, uh, we bring the people from that company into the workshop. We'll bring people from the location where they're going to launch from into that workshop. We'll bring in experts on land use and safety and all those kinds of things into the workshop. And in many cases, like I said, it's the first time they've ever been in that in, in a room together. And they start to understand what the problem is they're trying to solve. And then they start to think about what the possibilities really are. You know, do we have regulations that really don't matter? Um, can we get rid of those regulations uh, because they're not important? And that you know, might eliminate a 10-week you know, process that was in place before. Um, so we do that. We bring in our students as well from all the other areas like I talked about before. Uh, we have them provide their input as well. And they also help us with a lot of the technology and coding and, and things that happen in the background when we produce prototypes of what we do. So that's how we, wor we work, right? We go through that innovation process. Uh, we define what we're going to build. We validate that. We build a prototype and get that in front of the people that we're, we're working with and have them take a look at that prototype and say, yep, that's what we want to do, or nope, that's not it, but we do it quickly. So we deliver our prototypes in about 10 to 15 weeks, um, get people to understand what it is that we're building for them, and then we move forward from there. So that's, that's how the Digital Transformation Hub works. Um, one of the things that we're really looking at uh, related to COVID is that we think uh, space and AI is a, a new industry that will really need to produce a new workforce. Um, it's, a, it's an industry that hasn't exploded the way we think it can and should, but we think in the future it will. So that's another part of the thing we're doing at the, at the university to build that workforce. Excellent, and Paul, real quick, if you could possibly give us a, a real brief, is, is there a specific project that you might be able to share that your students have done as part of this partnership that you could share with us? Um, there's, there's a lot of them. Um, not so many focused on AI and space, but we have we did work on a really interesting challenge with the city of Santa Monica in California. Um, and as all of you probably know, there are lots of um, electric scooters on sidewalks these days of uh, the world. <laughs> uh, the city of Santa Monica was doing a, a pilot program where um, they had several scooter companies. Uh, they allowed them to have their scooters out on the sidewalks and they were looking for the problems that they might see. And what they found was that a lot of people were riding the scooters on sidewalks and causing all kinds of havoc around that, right? Running into people and causing that kind of issue. So they came to us and said, hey, can you help us figure out how to keep those scooters off sidewalks? Hmm. So we had our students take a look at this problem and they said, well, there's some new GPS technologies that can get pretty close to where we wanna go. Let's see if we can develop uh, technology around that and then if we detect that the scooters are on sidewalks, we'll turn off the motors on the scooters. That almost worked, um, but it wasn't quite good enough. So our students said, well, what about an accelerometer? Can we measure the surface of the sidewalk and we'll see an expansion crack as a peak in the data every four feet or so. And if we see that, then we know huh. it's on a sidewalk. Nice. And then, so we built that, uh, did all the 3D printing, built the electronics in about a month period. And, uh, and that kind of solved that problem. So that was kind of interesting. Interesting, and I like how that clever technique of deciding whether it was on the sidewalk or not, because that's this really, really, uh, really clever uh, approach. Uh, and Amy, uh, did you have something you wanted to add on that? Yeah, just because I think it's analogous, that the scooter conversation I think is analogous to the, the broader conversation we're having about artificial intelligence and scraping and, and refining and optimizing data for the purpose of making life easier, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the challenges is that oftentimes AI is seen as this sort of great panacea and the people who are developing or investing in or trying to regulate the field don't themselves have enough familiarity. Um, they don't even have the lexicon sometimes. And so what winds up happening is solutions race ahead of the current existing problems. And that winds up causing potential and potentially dangerous uh, downstream implications. So in Pittsburgh, outside of Carnegie Mellon, uh, where Uber has a has a base of roboticists, um, there were electronic uh, sort of land-based drones, so autonomous vehicles 
that need to rely on computer vision and parsing and spatial computing and all the stuff that you would need. And for a while, these little delivery drones were doing a great job. And it's a college campus. Lots of people want to order stuff. Everything is great. And then one day, somebody uh, in a electric powered wheelchair got trapped in the street. And the reason oh. that they got trapped in the street is because in sort of rushing to a cool solution, which is let's make these delivery vehicles uh, sort of scalable, um, they trained on the sidewalk. So the sidewalk problem that the scooters have, right? It's a similar kind of problem. What they forgot is that the reason that the dips exist um, between the sidewalk and the road is to, is to enable people who have difficulties to cross the street. This is one of those cases where there just wasn't a broad enough base of people, there wasn't enough um, testing, and there, there weren't the typical models that you would build to think about next order implications. So this is kind of different than modeling risk for purposes of, of legality or compliance or future litigation. This is thinking through if A happens, you know, then what? And we already have challenges with this on the ground because we're not really set up to think about long-term implications. Um, once we go off planet, you know, we're, we're going to run into some of the same challenges. And now, as the technology is being developed, is the perfect time to do some of that longer range scenario planning. Um, so just because we're talking about scooters and it's analogous to space, it's just a good way to sort of think through um, how to organize our thinking around some of this. Right. And, 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 and thinking about two things that you just brought up there is that we may now, using um, data and AI from space, we may actually be able to have deeper thoughts about the second and third order effects about what we're doing to our own planet, um, be right. it for urban development or what we're doing in terms of climate and, and things like that. And then, like you said, we've also got to think about whatever we put up there and where we send it, when, especially when it starts going beyond Earth's orbit. Um, right. But the only way to make... And the only way to make sure that this happens is to make sure that you have a broad enough spectrum of information. Most people, when thinking about the future, think far too narrowly, and they don't involve the right group of people. So you need cross-functional teams. You need to drastically widen the aperture um, and so that you are thinking more orthogonally about not just one particular slice of technology or its impact, but all of the related and adjacent and theoretical technologies that fit into that entire ecosystem. Excellent, and it, it builds on what, what Paul, you were also saying about how your students, uh, in some respects, they bring a diversity of perspectives and views with that as well. Um, Anthony, maybe I'll go to you and then I'll go to Paul. Um, what are some of the, the, the techniques you have to do when you're trying to make sense of what is being observed from space to actually then translate that into what can be done in a, in, to inform businesses. So when I say being observed from space, I, I'm imagining, you know, sitting in space observing. I, it, to me, it's it's pretty humble. You know, I might get satellite imagery. I might get some information that, that has been curated from space, right? Right. To me, it's a data set. So um, it's the same kind of issues I would have with any set of data. What's the character and quality of the data. So what is it, what do they claim is in the data versus what's actually in the data? Uh, that includes understanding how long ago it was collected, how completely it was connected, et cetera. Provenance and permissible use, as we talked about. And then I'm trying to triangulate it with something I already know. The biggest issue with any cool set of data, and especially any very large cool set of data is confirmation bias. You go in there and you will see exactly what you expect to see. Right? So you have to be very, very careful to set up controlled tests to understand what you expect to see and how you would know that you're seeing it. You have to use you know, good old fashioned math to make sure that <laughs> the kind of cool stuff that you're doing doesn't overwhelm the fact that you still need to be able to reproduce it. It has to be empirically rigorous. It has to be something you can sustain over time, not just you know, one and done. Um, so, you know, none of the problems are new. They might happen in a slightly cooler way, but they're really the same problems we've had in data science since they invented data. And you, and it's good that you talked about how people can see what they want to see in data. Uh, Absolutely. Whether it's, and so, so how do you, are there human approaches that you use to overcome yeah. that? So one, one of the gold standards for doing something new that's never been done before, where you can't just sort of machine learn your way longitudinally into the past, is something called heuristic evaluation. You get a bunch of people 
who are similarly instructed and similarly incented to form an opinion on what you think you're looking at. And then you let the algorithms compare their results to what the people saw and hmm. you converge on getting at least consistent with the, the majority report of the people because the people never agree with each other either. And right. then you have to do things like measuring um, uh, whether or not somebody is particularly aggressive in their ratings, whether or not somebody is particularly pessimistic and so forth. So there's inter-rater bias that you have to control for. Uh, but basically we converge on what people think. And the same thing with the sidewalk. I'm sure that w that's a brilliant idea. I was thinking of a couple other ways for how would you know you're looking at the sidewalk. At the end of the day, you have to ask people, all right, the algorithm thinks this is a sidewalk. Is this a sidewalk? You, you, you can't get around heuristics when you've never seen it before and it relates to people. Right. And, and what I like about that is, 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 is you recognize that, that people may not agree as, it, as well. But what you're really doing is, is using people and the algorithms to see where they converge. Well, and there's ways of cheating. You know, you use an odd number of people so that there's never, you know, there's never a tie. Um, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of things you can do to, to, to deal with. The fact that you don't want to have a political stalemate in the in the data deadlock. Yeah, right? and you can't let people have too much. Remember, I said similarly instructed and similarly incented, right? So you can't have two experts and five interns, right? Right. Um, you have to have people that have the same kind of a priori knowledge. They have to sort of want or not want at the same level for the success of what they're doing. They can't get tired. Uh, they can't try to score well on the exam. These are all things we know how to measure. Uh, so we just have to make sure we measure them and we don't forget. Excellent. Uh, so Frederick, I think you're back. Um, if yes. you would like to talk to us a little bit about, uh, did we lose them again? Oh, nope, I'm here. All right, but we may have lost your camera. So let's see if we can get your camera back. I'm gonna go to Paul real quick. Maybe if you can hook up to your laptop camera, we're gonna go to Paul real quick and then we'll circle back to you. Paul, sort of the efforts that you're doing with your students, uh, and what you're doing with your, 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 your hub and transformation. Are there things that might be able to help us with the COVID-19 recovery? So I, I, think, I think so. So with the COVID-19 recovery, we, we all know that COVID has affected all industries, uh, all countries around the world. Um, you know, and at this point, much of the, much of the economy around the world is, uh, is either slowed down dramatically or, or not moving at all. So I think to get ourselves back moving again, one of the things we need to do is take a look at what kinds of things can we do um, and what kinds of things make it make a difference, right? So if we're looking at AI in space, let's talk about that for a second. So today we're, we're almost at the point where we can launch satellites that can actually do data processing um, in space, right? So there's a lot of data that gets transmitted back to Earth today that is unuseful. Um, and I, I knew I had found a reason to bring this. Um, Excellent, we have a model. <laughs> so, so back in the 90s, um, I worked for um, Digital Globe, which then was called Earthwatch. And this was the first satellite, high resolution commercial satellite we ever launched. Hmm. Um, and I was, uh, I was working on this project and I was designing um, the data formats that were being used for the data that came, came from that satellite. Um, but we, when we collected data with that satellite, everything we collected, we sent back to the ground station and it would be transmitted across the world to our data center and we processed that data. And by the time that all happened, it was months after we collected the data, right? So more recently, things are getting faster, but still there's limitations out there. Right, there's ground station limitations, but there's more satellites, but they still have to download the data when they are inside of a ground station and then that, that data goes to the cloud or the data center and gets, gets analyzed. If we can do more analysis on the spacecraft and perhaps just all that is is to send the data back to the data center that we really need, right? It might be a 10th of the data that we're collecting it really eliminates that need to send all of that data back. So that's gonna make things faster. Um, I think there's lots of other things that we can do on the spacecraft, especially with the new uh, telecommunications networks that are being launched, right? I think there's three companies now that are gonna send multiple thousands of satellites uh, into space and, and be able to collect data from around the planet, which is not able, we're not able to do today. Um, so once we can do that, we're enabling parts of the world that have no 
good connectivity today to all of a sudden have connectivity where they can receive data, get information, respond to trends, do all the kinds of things that you know we've been doing in California for a long time, but out in the middle of Africa, they're not. <laughs> so so I, I think the economy has the opportunity to grow dramatically because of that. And I, and I know that that's not happening today, but it's not so far out, I don't think, um, where you know those capabilities are going to be possible around the world. Um, and working with um, the innovation centers that AWS has put together around the world, so I think there's 11 of them. We were the first one. There's, I think, 11 now in various countries around the world where we're able to collaborate and talk about the kinds of challenges that they're having in different parts of the world and getting our students to talk about how they might work on some of these problems and solve solve big problems around the world that aren't able to be done today. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking about the future, but the future for this is maybe three to five years out, not 10 to 30 years out, I think. It's closer than we think. And that's inspiring because I, I think we, if any time now in the middle of trying to think about how we respond to COVID-19 and, and help recover, it's good to see uh, the efforts that you're doing. Uh, uh, Frederick, uh, could you share a little bit about uh, what are you hearing both from Sweden and Europe? Uh, what, are, what are people approaching you uh, with the technologies that Unibop does um, to be used to, to help with either just general applications or possibly with the COVID-19 response? Um, so thank you for all comments so far. You touched upon very important areas. And I'd like to stress that from a Swedish perspective, we see more or less the same issues that you have raised. Um, we have uh, recently launched something called Space Cloud, where we actually are able now, even on small satellites, to launch x86 server infrastructure into space so that it looks exactly the same as on ground. And you can actually transparently move containers from the ground to space. And you can choose where you partition your uh, computing power and or how you partition your algorithms really so the kind of questions we get uh, is interesting one is from a regulatory perspective uh, the, the politicians here realize that we operate under a legislation from 1967 the outer space treaty which isn't really up to date to modern it models the other part of it is that they ask, how can we do more in space, generate the data points that you talked about earlier? Sweden has a big ground facility to downloading space data. It's just that we use about 1% of the downloaded data. We throw away 99% because the data is of no value. So how can we do more processing in space to extract important um, uh, parameters, for instance, uh, to understand if we have uh, illegal fishing is a big problem here. You have Arctic operations that we like to keep track of and things like that. If we can have an early alarm chain for that, that can really impact the economy as well. And obviously, if you have the ability to do more automation also in space, you can actually include satellite infrastructure in global decision making. We had a, a comment earlier from um, the DMB here uh, saying that they use a lot of satellite data, but they have a latency problem. So we can overcome that latency problem by putting the algorithms into the space cloud. Um, so these are big, big impacts, but it's also difficult in a Swedish context because we have to deal with politicians that have no space understanding at all. And they have a framework to operate under that is 50, 60 years old. And that's difficult. So, so overcoming legacy processes, even though you have new technologies. Um, yeah. Amy, you, you know, we, 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 we touched in the beginning of your remarks about how, how it may very well be we're held back because of some of the friction between industry and governments. Um, have you seen, I know recognizing you're a futurist, but have you seen ways of engaging people to overcome sort of legacy thinking and legacy processes that hold us back? Um, have you found anything that's successful? Right, so that is actually part of what we do. So the challenge when thinking about the future is overcoming and confronting cherished beliefs. Um, one of the problems that I'm seeing uh, emerge, although it was probably latent um, in the wake of this pandemic is that as people think about the future, they take signals that are familiar to them in the present and amplify them, which means the future of today will mean what we're currently going through only more. Um, the problem, of course, is that there, the, you know, as a futurist, as, as somebody who works with data and numbers, 
I will be the first person to tell you that I cannot predict the future. There, there are too many external variables. The math doesn't work out. We don't have a supercomputer in, uh, that, that is capable yet um, of having total uh, omniscient ability to understand every possible input, calculate it, crunch it, and then figure out every plausible solution. So with that being said, the challenge going forward is to ask a lot of questions, be willing to work incrementally, and to continuously confront those cherished beliefs. So um, Anthony mentioned heuristic versus uh, you know, heuristic uh, modeling, which is super important. And in some ways it's, it's even more important going forward um, because as everybody's trying to straighten out and think through what should the regulatory frameworks look like, what should the relationship between the public and private sector look like, I mean, the one thing that I think everybody should be thinking very hard about right now is what are the next order implications of this virus on how we relate to each other? The FAA has just, uh, just loosened some of its restrictions on um, line of sight and being able to fly drones, which means we have effectively cleared the way for drone-based delivery in the air. It right. is highly likely, given that we don't have people out and about, that we will have you know, greater flexibility with land-based uh, drone delivery. And as we think about off-planet exploration, we've seeded a significant amount of that, um, not just in the United States, but in many countries, to the private sector, which is fine, but you have to think through what does that mean once we have you know, uh, both unmanned and manned missions you know, off-planet. Um, it, again, you don't have to be a, so, so the question was who's doing this well <laughs> and the answer, <laughs> right. And the, and the answer is, I guess I'm, I'm not giving you a clear answer because I can't po point to a lot of clear examples where things have worked out well. There are frameworks to overcome and there are ways to do this, but it's going to require everybody being willing to give up a little bit. Uh, to get the right people into place, um, to work with cross-functional teams, and to dedicate yourselves to some type of methodology that gets beyond guesswork and is about modeling plausible alternative future states, both opportunity and risk, and then making incremental decisions. That works all of the time in the uh, private sector, where obviously we do a ton of work. I've been working uh, a lot and very hard to, to help our government agencies implement something similar. And it's more of a challenge, uh, to be frank, in, in the pu public side. Right. And I think it gets to what Anthony said, too, Yeah, that, that, that sometimes the way you've done something and, and government has not recognized that we may be living in a world in which things that used to be done by government can't solely be done by government. So they have to partner with industry. But even industry is like, aside from doing ROI and, and bringing value to the shareholders, how do I make this all work together? Um, right. But I think I Go ahead. I would, yeah, I mean, I would just, I would just add because, because you just said something very smart, which, which was calculating ROI in advance. The problem is when you are modeling things, and you know, we're not talking about an, like election polling. We're trying to figure out what is the future of X, where X is a fairly big, um, and, and in some cases, amorphous area. So, trying to pre-calculate ROI is going to ensure basically that you've got math. You've got, you've got financial projections that don't make any sense. Right. Um, so the goal is not prediction. The goal is preparation, which means that the preponderance of, of work should be done on making connections using signals in the present. The challenge is that everybody wants an answer. Our legislators want an answer. Politics is designed around having one answer. Um, with the significant amount of volatility and ambiguity and complexity that we are currently dealing with, you know, we have to restructure our thinking so that we're simply making, you know, we are, we are working on creating a state of readiness, given that there are many external inputs over which no one entity has control. That very well said. And, and, and I like to remind people that we're living in an age in which failure is not failure. Failure means first attempt at iterative learning because we're all gonna be trying to make sense of this rapidly changing world. Um, and, and maybe now you've actually thrown the gauntlet down for the other panelists to also weigh in. If we were to do something that was across sectors and across nations, maybe with the Atlanta Council, for instance, recognizing I'm biased, what might be something we could do? And I'm gonna go first to Frederick and sort of ask, if, if, you, could be, uh, if you could be president or prime minister for the day, and you could say, what would be an initiative that would work across sectors and nations involving data and AI in space? What would you recommend as a project to do? 
That's a very good question. And I would actually try to solve a simple, simple question. Who yields to whom in space? <laughs> so how do we get to a point where we have a regulatory environment that actually specifies how to drive in space? Because if we're going to launch 30, 40, 50,000 satellites into space and build an entire economy, on uh, low earth satellites and even beyond, we gotta have those pieces in place. And even today, we don't know if the space station or a satellite have to move because we don't know. Uh, you get a recommendation that maybe you should move, but there are no rules on who yields to whom. Hmm. So rules of the road for, for outer space and making sure, like as Amy talked about earlier, we span boundaries. Uh, Paul, I'll now go to you. If you were president for the day or, or head of the United Nations and you got to inform an effort that would try to work across sectors and nations, what would you recommend that we consider involving data and AI in space? Yeah, I would, um, if we think about nearly everything we do, it's all dependent on data. We were just talking about this at the university yesterday uh, about how we might address um, COVID moving to the future. and. You know, the first question was, do we have the data to be able to do this? So my point is we need data to be able to analyze and solve all kinds of problems around the world. So my solution would be, let's share capabilities and data in open source as it's collected so that others around the world can use that data and be able to solve problems that they have. Hmm. What this would also do is generate economic activity through innovation, through startups, through all kinds of other organizations who can use the data to help solve big world problems. So sharing data and sharing uh, capabilities would be what I would do if I could do that. Excellent. And I, what I like about your recommendation there is, I mean, we have an existing model where once GPS was shared with the commercial and the civilian sectors, there was a plethora of applications that became available that were not possible beforehand. And so if we can do even more with data and AI from space, that would be great. Uh, and and Paul and, and maybe real quick if you could just share is, is are there one or two initiatives that your students are doing that also give you hope in this space as well? Um, we are doing several initiatives um, with an international development organization, and we're looking at um, using data to track um, traceability for palm oil um, <laughs> in Southeast Asia. So we're looking at how we can. Uh, track the product from the field to the mill and to the market to make sure that that palm oil is not causing deforestation. So we have our students working on a project like that. We're looking also looking at some uh, road safety network uh, issues and school safety issues in Africa. Um, our students are using data for that as well. We're looking at uh, gender equity issues in Kenya as well. So all of these are using data and we're bringing in our, our, our data science students and faculty to be able to do um, senior projects, class projects around these kinds of problems and work directly with some of these organizations out there in the world. And they get that real world problem solving experience as well as being able to do the, the analytics on the data that, that they're using for that as well. So uh, we have several, several projects that are doing pretty well with that. Excellent, inspiring, and thank you, Paul. Um, so, so Anthony, uh, recognizing you know you 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 are you are pulled in many different directions by businesses, by world leaders, and and trying to answer questions that sometimes the data may not exist or may not uh, be be in a state where you can you can use it yet. What would you do if you were president or prime minister for the day in terms of initiatives involving data and AI and what we can collect from space? So specifically in the context of space, I think we have probably the only time, I hope, the only time in human history, an opportunity right now to see what happens to the earth when we stop messing with it. Hmm. We've got all kinds of data about what happens when planes stop flying. What ha The vibration of the earth has changed. There is so much data available right now on the unperturbed earth. So I think one thing we could probably all agree on is sharing that data to try to learn more about the harm that we might be doing. It's a little bit dangerous when you get into open data, this argument of make all data available to everyone everywhere. It breaks down pretty quickly. There's a lot of data that everybody shouldn't have. There's a lot of data I don't want. There's a lot of data that um, costs a lot of money to create and you can't necessarily make it available for free. 
Um, data out of context can sometimes be very confusing, but environmental data, data at rest about climate change data, that is just an, almost a no brainer to me. The one other thing I would like to add to, to a comment that was made before about modeling is that in a disrupted future, modeling has to have some sort of a premise to it, right? You have to have some sort of a baseline, they're called epistemologies. What do you believe in order to use the approach that you're using? But at the same time, you don't have to be perfect. You, you, I have a, a thing in my car that tells me how many miles to empty. And being a geek, I have calculated that it says zero when I have 30.4 miles more than when I can drive on level <laughs> ground before I actually run out of gas, right? So it lies. But now, unfortunately, I know how much it lies. And so I can take advantage of that envelope. Um, we have to be able to understand that's called decision elasticity. How wrong do you need to be in your model before you would make a different decision? Once you're inside that envelope, you don't have to be perfect. You just have to not make a different decision. And so as long as we keep that in mind in this disrupted future, we can do amazing things with data and analytics if we stop trying to get it perfect. Love it. And I love the idea of, like you said, decision elasticity, that, that again, we're all learning, we're all making sense of this. We are, gonna, we are going to learn as we go and have to be willing and be brave enough to do that. Uh, Amy, uh, if I can circle back to you and then we'll go to the lightning round. If you were president for the day or prime minister for the day, what would be an initiative that you would put forward uh, that we should consider doing? Sure, this is an easy one. Uh, it is to create a national office of strategic foresight, uh, which I have been pushing for now for several years. Um, and this will be another opportunity to talk about it. Part of the reason that we are in our current situation with COVID-19, and, and let's be honest, um, you know, we have also been dealing with climate change issues, we've been dealing with policy uncertainty, you know, we have a lot of challenges stemming in part from the rapid uh, development and research in, in science and technology. We're in the, the state that we are in because of a lack of long-term planning. And one of the benefits of a democracy is that we get to choose our leaders every couple of years. The downside, of course, is that we tend to have sort of this whiplash effect, especially in a, in a politically charged uh, environment, where policies, ideas, regulations don't have a longer term endpoint and we don't have a lot of alignment. A national office of strategic foresight that would be charged not with imagining the future, but uh, using data, building models, uh, adhering to a common uh, methodology and a common series of, of uh, frameworks in the United States within the federal foresight community <laughs> where there's some leadership would enable us to do longer term planning. We've been in this sort of situation where we're either playing catch up or we're trying to regulate after the fact. And that's just not good for business, for our economy, for everyday people. It's not good going forward. Um, so so the, the, the one thing that I would do would be to commit to long term planning, which means being willing to confront your cherished beliefs sometimes making politically unpopular decisions, but most of all, committing to a common framework uh, and a, at an office that has some enforcement mechanisms in order to imagine plausible future states in a world in which we're all happy to inhabit. Um, so, so that is paramount. And until we focus ourselves in that direction, I don't care if it, it could be legislative, it could be uh, in the executive branch, um, but but it has to be part of the federal government. And until we start moving in that direction, we are going to continue to cycle um, the way that we have. And this is a little different from the Office of Technology Assessment, which used to exist uh, and provided you know, a wonderful resource uh, at the time and became uh, sort of a gold standard for many other countries around the world. But things are different in the year 2020. Uh, the OTA has some political baggage. We need something new that enables us to do long-term planning, make incremental decisions, and to you know, work toward, in a longer-term way, a, a world that's, that's good for us all. Excellent. And, and uh, since you mentioned the, the US's, the United States' uh, federal foresight community, um, mm -hmm. I, I actually will, will, will share your idea and connect your idea with Leon Firth, as well as Sheila Ronas. Uh, they are also working on efforts at the grassroots level to do roundtables mm -hmm. to sort of solve 
the challenge that we do have polarization. We do also have massive misinformation as well, uh, which makes right. any foresight effort very challenging. But I, I like how you have both your effort and maybe their grassroots effort could work together. Yep, and there's a whole uh, published plan that that I, I wrote as, as part of a Stanford effort. So if anybody's interested, it's widely available, and I'm happy Excellent. to talk all day long about it. Well, we'll make sure we'll, we'll make sure to amplify it. <laughs> all right. So now we're in the final lightning round, where we're going to ask each of our panelists to spend one minute or less. And, and really, the question we're asked is if you remember that 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 image from space that was possible when we finally actually had. Um, both humans in space, but eventually humans on the moon. And that moment in which we recognized that it wasn't just our planet, but we could see our planet from above and how that inspired the multiple activities. I mean, it happened during the Nixon administration and it created both the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, also created the EPA because people saw that we were finally one planet. So the question is, you know, here we are in the middle of COVID-19. It seems like there's indecision, there's uncertainty, there's fragmentation, there's polarization. What would what would you say as a very short, no more than two tweet length answer? And we're going to go first to Anthony, then Paul, then we're going to Amy, and then Frederick. What would be something that you would want the world to be inspired to do, given how we can see how we are one planet from space? And so, Anthony, uh, not to put you in the spot, but you're first with your lightning round answer. Where to go but down? I would say three things. Number one, what do you have to believe in order to do what you're setting out to do? Number two, what's the bias in what you're trying to do? What, what do you bring with you that's sort of helping you or hurting you from seeing what you need to see? And the third thing is to always remember that the future will be continuously disrupted. This isn't some temporary state we're in, where once we get out of this, everything will be calm. There will be another disruption and another disruption. Um, lessons learned are only lessons learned if we learn from them. We have to make sure that we're getting smarter and we're making new mistakes. Well said. Paul, what would be your, your recommendation to, to sort of help us come together as a, as a world and as a planet? Yeah, I think um, what I would say is, I would want to tell people to think differently. Think differently about how to solve the problem, your problems. Understand the problems, understand your customer, understand what it takes to solve that problem and learn what the art of the possible is because that's what we see happening in the world, right? Is that lots of people don't understand what's possible with things like AI uh, or machine learning. So they can't think about how that could help them solve their problems. So learn what the art of the possible is, what my boss likes to call the art of the knowledgeable, <laughs> uh, and think differently about how to solve your problems. Very well said. Amy, what would you say? Sure. So what I would say is to be willing to steer into the skid. Um, everybody at some point has been in a car on an icy road. And when you start to slide, the biological inclination is to slam on the brakes. And as you know, if you've done that before, all that does is wreak havoc. Um, paradoxically, when you're on a slippery road, uh, you're not supposed to slam on the brakes. You're supposed to steer into the skid. Um, and while doing that, keeping your eye on the road ahead. If you stop and think about what would it take if I slam on my brakes and try to create a new normal in the car or to go back to the way that it was, you would have to, you would have to be omniscient. You'd have to know exactly what the tire pressure PSI was for all the, the tires and exactly what the tread was and exactly what the incline was and, and all of these things over which you have no control. Um, Right now, a lot of government agencies, a lot of companies, a lot of leaders are trying to slam on the brakes. They're trying to stop all of the changes that are happening as though they can. That is not the moment that we're living in. So the best thing to do, which feels wrong, is to steer into that uncertainty while keeping your eye on the road ahead and be willing to think long-term and near-term simultaneously while you slow things down and make incremental decisions. Making incremental decisions doesn't mean putting off big bets. It means working in a smarter way to the future. Well said, and I, and I like the, the, the imagery you had of, you know, steer into the, the skid as opposed to trying to slam on the brakes and find that you just made it worse. Uh, and then finally, Frederick, you have the last word. What would be your recommendation? So I would actually circle back to the infrastructure question because it's really important that you think about the consequences in space versus driving a car on ground. So if you're crashing 50, 100, 200 cars on the ground, 
not much happening. But if you're launching 30,000 satellites to build a new AI-driven economy in space, and only 10 of them collide, you can take out entire orbital planes and deny access for humanity to space. This is not a simple question. It's a very, very tough question to solve, both from a regulatory perspective, but also from an engineering perspective. How do we move these satellites? Uh, because they are bound to collide with the numbers that we are launching. Some have already collided and uh, denied us access to certain orbits. And these are the only orbits we have because we are on this planet. It's one planet and it's one space above us. Well said, and, and like you said, you know, we, we, we focus a lot on the planet and making sure that we don't pollute the oceans, that we don't have oil spills and things like that. Maybe that a lot of people don't realize that we could just as easily pollute and it would have much more detrimental effects if we had collisions in space as well. So that's definitely something that we need to come together across sectors and nations. Well, with that, I wanna thank each of our panelists. Uh, you are both inspiring and, and, and actually putting forward pragmatic ways we can move forward. Uh, and in particular, I like the idea that we have to recognize that we're in a world that is, that is one that we cannot necessarily control, but we can actually have both mid and long-term foresight, as Amy said. We can embrace thinking differently, thinking knowledgeably, as Paul said. Uh, Frederick says we can think about the infrastructure and making sure that we are recognizing that as we move towards this data and AI economy in space, that we're also making sure we preserve it. And then finally, as Anthony so well put it, we shouldn't assume that once we get through whatever we're currently in, that we're not gonna be disrupted again. If anything, the future is gonna be continuously disrupted, which means we have to be willing to do not only that first attempt at iterative learning, but the second, the third, the fourth, and show both perseverance, resilience, grit, and ultimately creativity. With that, thank you all for being the positive change agents that you are, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.